Uh, thank you very much for that, Paul Kirkman. Before I continue, uh, I've got my manners. We have Mary and Steve, and these two, they represent your district. So if, uh, could you just stand up so everybody can see who you are and you can see them? And then also just give them a round of applause. We're very, very happy both of you are here. Uh, again, I'll give 15 minutes to John Chasnoff, so your time will begin when you start. Okay. So thank you. I want to um, repeat what uh, Representative Kurtman said about the hospitality and the food at the Moss this, this evening. Uh, the presentation, too, on, on it, a quick overview of Islam was very informative, very well done. And I just very much appreciate you all turning out tonight and showing us your hospitality and also your interest in taking part in public affairs and, and seeing what's going on in the state legislature. Um, my name is John Chasnoff. I'm with the ACLU of Eastern Missouri, and one of my responsibilities is to oversee our legislative work. So we follow um, something like 200 bills in the Capitol. We have just a huge range of issues that we follow, but this bill has been of particular interest to us because we do have concerns about it. We do think that um, in some of its forms, which um, I think Mr. Kirkman is right to separate his bill from other bills that have been in the past. But um, what we've seen around the country is an evolution in these bills. And in their initial um, startup phase, they were most offensive. And since then, as they've been tinkered with and changed, they've been watered down and more or less begin to be neutralized. But they still have huge secondary effects that we think are of great concern to this community, to other religious communities, but also to the secular community at large. I don't think that the authors of these bills, which are popping up very similar bills around the country, have looked at the repercussions and the after effects and the side effects of these bills. So first of all, um, Mr. Kurtman has made the point that his bill only would disallow judicial consideration of foreign law if they somehow violate the Constitution. If that were the case, I'd be much less concerned about this bill. But that's not what it actually says. Um, in several places, it does say that. But there's one clause in particular that concerns us, and that's paragraph four. I'll try to just summarize it, because it, it gets a lot of ins and outs and a lot of legalese. But in paragraph four, it says that any court, any court's ruling or decision is void if the court bases its ruling in the matter at issue in whole or in part, so in any way if it considers foreign law um, that would not grant the parties the same fundamental liberties as our Constitution. So in other words, if a court looks at a foreign law in any way, and that law that it's looking at does not exactly mirror the Constitution, then the ruling that the judge makes is void. Now, evidently Representative Kirkman doesn't read it that way, but I've taken this to lawyers around the country. Our national staff at the ACLU has tried to read it from every point of view uh, that it can, and only comes up with that reading, that any foreign law is banned if it does not mirror the Constitution. Well, what foreign law doesn't mirror the Constitution? Sharia law does not mirror the Constitution. Jewish law does not mirror the Constitution. Catholic canon law does not mirror, mirror the Constitution. French law, English law, Spanish law, any law you can name might be better, might be worse. I don't know those laws very well. I'm a patriot, so I tend to think we've got a great legal system here. But none of those laws mirror exactly the Constitution of the United States. So a judge cannot consider those laws in any form whatsoever. Well, what are the consequences of that? Um, let's, let's take the example that uh, Representative Kurtman mentioned. Let's say there's a contract that muffles somebody's freedom of speech. Well, under this law, that would not be allowed. But are any of you communications people have worked in the community? I had dinner tonight with somebody who was a communications expert. And one of the things that you see often in the field of communication with broadcasters, if they get a job at a new company, lots of times um, they're, they're given a non-disclosure act. They can't talk about what happened at the previous company. It happens in business a lot, too, where there's a secret formula for Coca-Cola. And when you go to work for Pepsi, they don't want you taking the secret formula, formula over there, so you waive your First Amendment right and sign a non-disclosure contract. This law would not allow that. 
that's just one of the problems that it runs into when it comes to contract law. Um, let's say that we're two members of the board of a mosque, and we decide that we want to write a contract about how the mosque is going to function, and if we run into a dispute, we're going to arbitrate that through Sharia law. And that's our just mutual agreement. We're going to do that through Sharia law. Well, if for some reason one of the members of that contract doesn't honor it and sues somebody in a, in a secular court of law, the judge could not look at that case. What we have now is a system that takes care of those types of situations, and that's why I say that this is a solution in search of a problem. We already have ways to deal with secular law, with religious law or any foreign law when it comes up in our courts. It's called neutral principles of law. And so a judge looks at a contract and on the face of it, without getting into the complications of Sharia or the complications of the French law implied, he can look at the contract and he can say, well, look, you guys agreed to arbitrate this in a Sharia for forum and one of you has decided not to do that, you're obviously breaking the contract. And so I'm going to rule against you in my court and I'm going to send you back to the Sharia forum that you said you would operate under in the first place. That's called neutral principles of law. It's just a secular reading of a contract without entangling yourself in the religious law. That's the phrase that's usually used. And so these types of cases come up all the time and they're resolved without any problem. When we asked the sponsors of this bill, though, last year we asked Mr. Kirkman, this year a similar, uh, an identical bill is in the Senate, so we asked Senator Nieves, and we asked them, what's the problem here? Courts are already solving this problem. You know, there's a, there's a method, there's a process, it's taken care of all the time. They said, well, here's 17 cases that show the problem. And just coincidentally, all 17 of those cases are involving Sharia law. So that's why we think that there's some of the background of this showing. The bill last year that mentioned Sharia law specifically was the most egregious, but when you ask folks about this bill, what's the problem? It's all cases that involve Sharia law that pop up. But these are all cases that were resolved properly in our secular courts. Some of them are, are First Amendment cases. Let's say a Muslim prisoner is not being allowed to pray five times a day when he's in prison, so he goes to court and says, I'm, not, I'm being denied my religious freedom. Well, under this law, the judge couldn't look at Sharia law, so he couldn't know that a Muslim prays five times a day, so he'd have no basis for deciding that this person's religious freedom was being violated, and the religious freedom case would get thrown out of court. Now, that applies to a Christian who might be wearing a cross, or a Jew who is denied access to a Bible, all of those cases would be thrown out of court because the judge couldn't consider foreign law. Um, the other place, so, so this violates, I kind of want to tick off the various places that I think this violates the Constitution. That's where it violates the First Amendment. There's also a constitutional right to contracts. So if I'm forming a business relationship with you and we decide again, like I say, let's say, take that arbitration example, um, we decide to arbitrate our differences according to Sharia law or according to Jewish law. We've entered into a contract, and Missouri Constitution and the federal Constitution guarantees that right to a contract. Well, you wouldn't be able to enter into that con contract and have it enforced in a court of law, so you have a violation of your right to a contract. That's the second constitutional violation. The third constitutional violation is the one that Mr. Kirkman tried to um, this disown, which is the separation of powers question. So we have three equal branches of government, and one government branch cannot tell the other government governmental branch what to do. So in this case, you have the legislative branch telling the courts what laws they can consider in making a decision, and that's a violation of the separation of powers. Now, if the law just said, courts have to rule in a way that's consistent with our Constitution, that would be fine. But this goes beyond that and tells the judges how they have to look at evidence, and that's a violation of the judicial branch of government. Um, so finally, I mentioned that there is this problem with 